This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you episode 30 of season two of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Westford Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, July 24th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago. The first section in the July 24th paper is the Westford Center section. Invitations have been received by Westford friends for the marriage of Miss Edith A. Seifer, S-E-I-F-E-R, and and Elmer Dennis Cole to take place at the Congregational Church in this village Wednesday evening, August 4th at 7 o'clock. The ceremony will be followed by a reception in the church parlors. Miss Seifer has been for some time in Washington, D.C., where she met her prospective husband, but comes back to her girlhood home and the church of her former membership for her wedding. The Julian A. Camerons are at their summer home, Chebacco Island, which is in the uh, Essex River in Massachusetts, in Essex County. Mrs. Henry L. McCluskey, who has been assisting in the care of Deacon Wright during his illness for several weeks, returned to her home in Worcester the first of the week. The ladies of the Congregational Church held a meeting Tuesday afternoon at the Vestry to plan for their annual agricultural fair to be held in September. There was the usual good degree of interest and the appointing of the various committees. The little three weeks old daughter of Mr. and Mrs. John H. Martin died July 20th at her home in the south part of the town the first of this week. The little one was very frail and tiny from birth and the struggle for existence proved too great. The funeral was held Thursday afternoon. Reverend Charles P. Marshall was the officiating clergyman. Interment was in Fairview. A prayer service was also held at the grave. The baby's name was Dorothy Dorothy Evelyn Martin, having been born June 29, 1909, and christened about two weeks ago by Mr. Marshall. A number of substantial improvements have been made at the Congregational Parsonage, uh, which is at 23 Main Street, the last year or two for the comfort and convenience of its inmates. Inmates seems like a strange synonym for pastors. Now a piazza is being built across the entire front of the house, which will be a decided addition. William Sutherland is doing the work. Piazza building seems especially in his line just now, he having just completed a fine one for Walter J. Merritt. The next paragraph is entitled, Struck by Lightning. During the severe thunderstorm last week, Friday afternoon, the house of James Spinner on the Boston Road was struck by lightning. It entered the house at the cable, tearing off the window casing and plastering in the upstairs bedroom and breaking several panes of glass in the window, after which it passed down through the floor to the room below, demolishing a picture on the wall and passing out through the side of the house. Luckily, none of the members of the Spinner family were in that part of the house where the lightning struck. The next section is the About Town section. Fletcher and Leahy, the Oak Hill Stone Contractors, the Honorable H.E. Fletcher being the Herbert, the, the leading member of the firm, have the contract for the overhead bridges at Fitchburg from the Boston and Maine Railroad in discontinuances of grade crossings and have the work well underway. The mere mention of the name of this firm is a guarantee of satisfactory work. Taylor Brothers have the contract for painting the waiting station of the Lowell and Fitchburg Electric Railway at the corner of Lowell and Stony Brook Road, and it has always has already begun to remind the traveler of the wearing of the green. I'm pretty sure that the, this is Sam Taylor's, who's writing this piece, and I believe when he says Taylor Brothers, he mentioned he means his two sons. William Rubin, who was 31, and John Adams Taylor, who was 26. 
The Westford ball team went to Lincoln last Saturday and met one of the best equipped teams in any rural community. And although the Westfords had by far the best of it in the early part of the game, the score standing 12 to blank, an unexpected spurt in batting on the part of the Lincoln team made them the winners by the close margin of 13 to 12. That is an unusual game indeed. The many logs in Stony Brook at West, Westford Station, after having been immersed for several months, are being propelled to shore by man, boat, and horsepower. They have soaked up a deal of water, but plenty left for everybody else who are inclined that way. The Sunday School of the Methodist Church at West Chelmsford, which includes Westford Corner, Oak Hill, Brookside, and various other scattered fragments of rural life not yet large enough to be named Village, will take a trolley ride excursion to Canopy Lake Park Wednesday, July 28th. Special rates, special cars, and a special good time. Henry B. Reed had a seriously ill horse last week. The telephone being ill at the same time, he was obliged to summon a veterinary from Lowell by a personal handshaking. The horse is better, and so is the telephone. Last Sunday at the Unitarian Church, Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey delivered a strong and logical sermon of the earlier New England type on, quote, foundations, end quote, deploring the lack of foundations on the part of too many of our youth and equally deploring the other extreme of willingness on the part of mature life to accept for, quote, foundations, end quote, the the authority of tradition and custom, largely because it is ancient. The reason of man is the telescope in search of truth. Let no ancient veil obscure obscure the, the search. Let no one intrude his authority without reserving the personal right to the personal discovery of truth in rebuttal. This was the last service before vacation, and the church will be closed until the first Sunday in September. Reverend Seth Walker is holding large tent meetings on a vacant lot on Shaw Street, Lowell. A native of the town, he was born and raised on the family farm at what is now 148 Main Street. He invites everybody to come down and every any afternoon and evening, except Saturday and Sunday, when at the tent there is nothing doing, for these are the days when the church on Branch Street is going. Henry B. Reed is adorning Francis Hill with utility with his new thrifty apple orchard set out last spring and one year ago. If there is any error, it is in their too near neighbor, neighborliness, an ancient error from Adam's apple orchard to date. Twenty feet apart should be multiplied by two, even if they are the early and small type. Plenty of landscape, why crowd? The assessors have emerged from their duties so far as to make a formal introduction to the, of the tax collector to the taxpayers, clothed with warrants and books of a searching nature. So keep quiet and try and have a satisfied look while he takes your picture. The duplicate proofs of your own action will soon be mailed to you. If dissatisfied with your picture, don't throw dust at the collector. Remember, it is the very picture that you ordered last March. That is, at town meeting. It looked smiling then. The approach of payday may tend to make it wear or frown. The collector is not responsible for the change of expression. Uh, Here, Sam Taylor obviously thinks the town voted to spend too much money at the last, last town meeting. The next section is called the deer question. And now comes word that deer are doing damage to the young apple orchards recently set out on Francis Hill. Under the present law, a person can shoot deer if you can get near and on the owner's land. But isn't the time watching for deer about as damaging and deer, D-E-A-R, as trimming apple trees by deer, D-E-E-R? Extermination, say some. Oh, yes, and crows, woodchucks, and birds, say others. But extermination is not the way to deal with nature that combines the usefulness and the beautiful. That is occasionally starved into an assault and battery on the creatures of man. As we've seen before, Sam Taylor is also a strong defender of our wildlife. The next section is called A Candidate. 
Alon- Alonzo G. Walsh of Lowell has been making an auto visit to his personal friends in town recently. He makes the announcement that he is a candidate from this district for state senator on the Republican ticket. The district is a heter- heter- heterogeneous affair physically and industrially, running from air out into the Atlantic Ocean. How far out? Don't know, don't anybody. Industrially considered, it includes almost everything used in civilization, from whales to white beans, so that a man so properly, a man to properly represent this district should have a sort of heterogeneous ability or should be much in many directions. Mr. Walsh has had experience in the Lowell Board of Trade as chairman of the city committee, as an expert in lines of manufacture, as conversationalist and debater, as private citizen without suspicion, suspicious action. Nature gifted him for this office. His ability, as well as his location, should be considered as favorable factors towards his nomination. The next section is called the Soldier's Monument. Colonel Edwin D. Metcalf has written a patriotic letter to the selectmen informing them of his intention to present to the town a soldier's monument in memory of those who left their homes from 1861 to 1865 at the call of Abraham Lincoln, also in memory of the pleasant school days passed by Colonel Metcalf in Westford. It is his desire to curb and grade the triangular lot suggested by Captain Fletcher. That's Captain Sherman Fletcher. The monument to be of Barry, New Hampshire, but uh, it has New Hampshire, but I think Barry, Vermont is meant. Granite and the figure of a marching soldier to be of United States standard bronze is ex- expected to be completed and in position this fall and dedicated next Memorial Day. He appoints Captain Sherman H. Fletcher to act as his representative in consultation with the selectmen as representing the town. We'll hear, um, we'll hear more about this in coming uh, weeks. The selectmen, in reply to Colonel Metcalf's generous and patriotic offer, expect, express the usual abundant thanks and courtesies and add, quote, it is most appropriate that your native town should accept from so successful a son a soldier's monument in memory of those who fought in the War of the Rebellion. Particularly is this so in that your father was the first citizen to volunteer in Westford and the only commissioned officer from Westford in the war. Colonel Metcalf's father mother and brother rest in Fairview Cemetery so that the associations of early boundary of early boyhood days and school days and enlisting days and cemetery days all combine to make this presentation by Colonel Metcalf a memorial on be, on uh, many foundations the patriotism of those who fought in the war and the patriotism of this gift should shadow and silence all dissension as to location, inscription, and details of procedure. You may recall that a week or two ago, Sam Taylor spoke strongly in favor of putting the Civil War monument behind the canyon, the cannon at the eastern point of the common instead of in the triangle of land where it now stands. He now clearly supports the choice of the majority. The next section is the Graniteville section. Little Nina McCarthy, the nine-year-old daughter of Mr. and Mrs. R.J. McCarthy of this village, fell from the milk wagon of her uncle, John Healy, in which she is in the habit of riding each morning, dislocating her right shoulder and injuring the ligaments of the arm. Dr. Warren H. Sherman was summoned and attended the injured member, and although the child suffers severe pain at times, no serious results are anticipated. Uh, Dr. Sherman was the the, uh, doctor that lived in Graniteville. Mrs. Samuel H. Armand preached at the Baptist Chapel in North Westford on last Sunday and made a good impression. Uh, Reverend and Mrs. Armand both attended the Boston University School of Theology, and Reverend Armand was the pastor at the Methodist, Methodist Episcopal Church in Graniteville, and in January of 1910, he would resign his position there. And in March, he and his wife sailed from San Francisco, San Francisco to Manila to become missionaries in the Philippines. Reverend Armand uh, even learned the native language so he could speak to the natives in their own tongue. 
Sadly, he died of diphtheria in Manila in a Manila hospital, March 28, 1913. Mrs. Armand, who was pregnant with their first child, brought his ashes home to Indiana, his home state, for burial, where she gave birth to a daughter. Many people from the village attended the special memorial services for the late Myron A. Karkin that were held in Fort Forge Village on last Sunday. The editor of The Wardsman is to be commended for the excellent half-tone photo of Myron A. Karkin that was used in connection with the story of the sad accident and death in a recent issue. It is safe to say that owing to the speaking ill, the speaking like the quote speaking likeness end quote as many expressed it, those papers have been sent to all parts of the country. Next section is baseball. The Graniteville Blues visited Lowell on last Saturday and met with defeat at the hands of the Crescents by the score of 7-5. to five. Both sides batted freely throughout the contest, and the result of the game was in doubt until the last man was out in the, in the final inning. The local club was somewhat handicapped owing to the grass diamond and uneven outfield, but nevertheless played a good game. Gilson of the Blues played a star game both in the field and at the bat, his heavy stick work coming in at just the right moment. Ledwith also found the ball for a slashing double and caught his usual clever game. Hansen at third appeared to have an off day, his slip up on, th on thrown balls being re responsible for three runs. His clever catch of a hard liner in the sixth, completing a double play unassisted, partly redeemed his slow work in the early part of the game. The locals have now lost three games, and it is time they should have awakened to the fact that more teamwork is needed, and unless more ginger is infused in their work, they will find themselves at the bottom in the league standing. Remember, boys, there are nine men in the club, and that the pitcher and catcher cannot do it all. Howarth started to pitch for the Blues, but owing to a lame arm, retired after the first inning in favor of McCarthy. Ledwith, who caught, ran into a post while going after a foul fly, and although he was knocked out for the time being, took his place behind the bat and finished the game. On Saturday, the Blues will play at West Chelmsford, and for the next four Saturdays following, the local club will play on the home grounds. Now, boys, get into the game and do your level best, for the village people are with you and want to see you play the game as you are capable of playing it. I've never seen an article on the Wardsman quite like that one where they actually find fault with a ball team in town. <laughs> the next uh, section is the Forge Village section. Miss Catherine Brown, one of our well-known young ladies, is at the Lowell General Hospital, where she underwent a very serious operation for appendicitis. Many friends brighten the long hours of illness by kind remembrances of beautiful floral gifts and also by going to see her as often as is, is advisable. Miss Brown has always been interested in what, whatever was for village pleasures. When the young ladies formed a swimming club, she was one of the first to make a record by swimming across Forge Pond and returning twice during the season. The pond is about one mile wide. She was also an expert with oars. Miss Alice L. Prescott has just returned from a very pleasant outing at Revere Beach and has entertained a party of her friends at Whist recently. A dainty luncheon was served of ice cream, cake, and fruit punch. At present, she is entertaining some of her, for, of her school friends. The Forge Village Lions defeated the Middlesex team on the grounds here Saturday afternoon by the score of 11 to 1. The memorial services uh, were held at St. Andrew's Mission Sunday evening for the late Myron A. Karkin, and there were many present although there was a very severe thunder shower at the time the service commenced. That's the news in Westford for the week ending July 24th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from The Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical, 
Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.